This is Derek Redmond of Great Britain, a promising 400-meter runner whose career has been plagued with injuries. At the 1988 Seoul Olympics, Redmond was given a good chance of winning a medal. But just before his first qualifying race, he had to withdraw because of a pulled Achilles tendon. Other injuries forced him to miss major competitions, including the European Championships and Commonwealth Games. When the British 4x400 relay team defeated the heavily favored foursome from the United States at the 1991 Tokyo World Championships, Derek Redmond ran the second leg and became internationally known. However, in the following months leading to Barcelona, Derek Redmond's physical condition was suspect. But here in Barcelona, Derek Redmond is in excellent physical shape. It is 7.35 p.m., Monday evening, August 3rd. Eight men line up for the first 400-meter semifinal. The first four finishers will qualify for the final, scheduled two days later. The favorite in the race, defending Olympic champion Steve Lewis of the United States. His main challengers, Roberto Hernandez of Cuba and Derek Redmond of Great Britain. The race gets underway. Redmond is fourth from the left. Steve Lewis is in lane three. Because the lanes are staggered, Redmond will not see Lewis until they straighten out for the stretch run. Redmond starts to make up the stagger on the runners outside of him in lanes six, seven, and eight. I couldn't believe that I was running that quick. Couldn't see Steve Lewis because he was on the inside of me. And then the next thing I heard was a funny pop. Derek Redmond has a torn hamstring in his right leg. After only 150 meters, his quest for an Olympic medal is over. The race goes on. Steve Lewis, third from the right, starts his drive. Derek Redmond is in severe pain. I remember looking up across the back straight because by this time everyone had gone round the bend and were halfway down the home straight uh, and then I watched them go over the line and obviously I knew it was over. Now for Derek Redmond, the only reward will be a personal one. The knowledge that he finished what he set out to do. You had people coming out with the stretchers and it was that that made me get up and, and run because I ain't getting on that stretch yet. I got too much pride to want to be stretched out of the stadium. Uh, if you ask me why I did what I did, I couldn't tell you. I couldn't say exactly what made me do it. I couldn't remember how it was done. It was just a fatherly instinct, and up to this day, I don't know why I did it. The first thing my dad said is he put his arms around me, and he said, look, you don't have to do this. Um, and, I, and I tell him, I said, I do. And he said, well, if you're going to finish this race, we'll finish it together. When I told him I was, that he didn't have to do it, he told me that he wasn't going to be carried off, he was going to finish, and he asked me to get him back into lane five. And that wasn't the place to have a family argument, so I just complied with his wishes. turned out to be the worst day of my life. I've never been shot in my life, but I honestly thought I'd been shot. And uh, I remember just thinking, oh, it's Munich, 72, all over again. And people always ask me two questions. What made you get up? Which is the first question, which, well, as I explained, I honestly thought for 15, 20 seconds that if I got up and started running, that I could still qualify. And the other question people ask me is, you know, with 100 meters to go, your dad sort of came on. And up until that point, you'd pretty much kept all your emotions in and everything. And as soon as you saw your old man, it sort of all went out the window. You know, do you know why? And I don't really know why I did what I did. I don't know why I just broke down at that, at, at that stage. The only thing I can say is anything that comes into my mind, I was ranked seventh in the world. I'm in the Olympic semi-final with 100 meters to go. And I look over my left shoulder and my dad's level with me. If that don't make you cry, <laughs> I don't know what will. But... I ended up finishing the race anyway. 
And you might say, well, why have you shown all this and then show us that race? Well, the reason I show you this and then I show you that race is because the best made plans don't ever go right without things going wrong. Right, granted, I had a major problem in there. But I ask how many of you have set yourself a target or a goal in your business or in your personal life and have reached that target or goal without a single thing going wrong? Exactly. Whenever we set ourselves targets or goals, things can, will, do go wrong. And the thing that you've got to try and do is get through them. If you imagine it as like a wall, you've got to get through that wall, climb over it, dig under it, go around it, smash it down, get to the other side of that problem. And it might mean in your business life you've got to take a big side step and maybe set a goal that's slightly easier before you can go to the goal that you originally set. But you've got to keep on moving forward. Because if you don't keep moving forward, your competitors are going to keep on moving forward. And I, I, I like to think that life is a bit like a Rubik's Cube. And I don't, everybody knows what a Rubik's Cube is, yeah? How many people have had a go at a Rubik's Cube? How many people have done a Rubik's Cube? See, it's gone a bit quieter, isn't it? It was like, yeah, yeah, oh, no. Well, did you know there are 11 million, million combinations on a Rubik's Cube? I don't think that's half as many as there are problems that can go wrong in everyday life at work. So if you think that 11 million, million problems on a Rubik's Cube is a lot, just go to work every day. You can find possibly 11 billion, billion problems. Talking of Rubik's Cube, I've got one here. And I'm going to need some help. Everyone's thinking, oh God, who's going to pick me now? Well, I can't see many people here, so I'm just going to pick, I don't know, Nigel Wells, are you in the room? Could you come up here, please? <laughs> We're going to have a little bit of fun with this cube, because as I say, I think life is a bit like a Rubik's Cube. And Nigel, uh, the reason your name was picked out, because when I got asked to do this job, they said, is there anything you need to know? Is there anything you want? So I said, who messes up a lot of work? And uh, this came up. So all you've got to do is mess the cube up. That's all you've got to do. Just do what you do well, apparently. I just saying that. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. And we're going to have a bit of fun, because what we're going to do while, while Nigel sort of messes that cube up, is I say, we're going we're to all work together now. I'm going to become part of IBM, if you like. And our aim is to get this cube done. And as I say, there are 11 million, million problems. There might be 12 million by the time he's finished. But we're going to have a go. Have you done that? Yep. That looks pretty good. Thank you very much. You can, uh, you can take a seat. Cheers. Thanks very much. Give him a round of applause. And as I say, our aim now is to do this cube. Now, it's no different from what you do in work. I'm going to turn it behind my back and just mess it up a little bit because uh, you didn't mess it up as well as you thought you could. So I'm just <laughs> twiddling it around. I'm not honestly doing it, honestly. I'm just sort of turning it around, just make it a bit easier. There we go, right. Now, when we set ourselves a target or a goal, or in some cases someone sets ourselves a target or a goal, and you set off on this new quest, confidence is high because you think, yeah, I'm going to prove not only to my bosses, but also to competitors and everybody I know, maybe my family, that I can actually do what has been asked of me. Have a complete... Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> you can't really see, but from that side, the cube <laughs> looks done. But if you actually look, even from that end, it looks done. But if you look around the edge, there's just four cubes that are in the wrong places. Now, I can hear people saying, pull the stickers off. <laughs> Prize it apart. But honestly, in your business life, can you pull the stickers off? Can you price things apart? Because at the end of the day, you're going to get found out. So it might be a case where you have to uh, speak to a couple of your team members. Maybe someone comes up with something different. A few twists, a few turns, and not only have we completed the cube, but we've achieved what we set out to do. Thank you. Now, I, I, I know it's... I know it's a bit gimmicky, I know it's a bit of a, of a gimmick doing it you know, with the Rubik's Cube, but it is a good example of all the things that could possibly go wrong, because every time you turn this cube, you're not just moving one cube, you're moving at least 36 cubes. And with 11 million million combinations and 36 cubes being moved at once, I think it's very rem reminiscent of all the problems that can happen in your own business life, let alone all the problems that your competitors will create for you. I hope you've enjoyed what I have to say. If you have, my name's Derek Redman. If you haven't, my name's Chris Akabusi. Thank you very much.